1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now we got some, we got some uh, dispensationalists in this world that's so legalist. They're so scared of being identified as something religious that they can't even have a good time anymore. They can't sing hymns without nitpicking them. They can't, can't, can't celebrate the resurrection of our Lord because they don't want to be associated with Catholics and everything else. And I, I just, I, I look at it like this, uh, uh, a man, a man so so uptight in his knowledge and faith, that he can't he can't celebrate the resurrection of our Lord is just as weak in the faith as the ones out there thinking that something special is going on today because they ate some Easter bun there on Friday and celebrated their forty days of Lent. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Reality is, man, Passover was Friday. We know our Lord was risen from the dead the first day of the week after Passover. And so, listen, man, quit being so uptight. Right? You got, you, got a, you got a man that died on a cross for you, shed his blood for you, was risen from the dead. You got eternal life through him, man. Just have a good time. Amen? Amen. 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 And, uh, you, you know, one of the things, you know, that man died for Paul Lucas. Right? I, I make that personal. This stuff of Christ dying for all men, I know, I know he gave his life a ransom for all. But the reality is, man, he died for me. Right. And, the, and the, you know, Dr. Ruckman told a Muslim that one time. A Muslim came in trying to argue with Doc, and Doc said, what did Muhammad ever do for you? Yeah. And that Muslim started telling him, well, you, you know, he, 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 he lived, lived, lived his life. He was a prophet of God. He said, no, 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 no. He said, what did Muhammad do for you personally? Mm -hmm. That guy couldn't come up with nothing. Ruckman said, Jesus Christ died for Peter S. Ruckman. Yeah. And he said, and he held up that song book, and he said, if you want proof, he said, there it is. He said, 500 songs written about one man. Yeah. He said, where's the little kid singing to Muhammad? We have heard the joyful sound, Muhammad saves, Muhammad saves. Right? Jesus Christ shed his blood for Paul Lucas. Yes, and my New Testament was given to me through that blood. I have no connection to that cross except through what the Lord gave me. When you understand, and this, this is why I get so bent out of shape, this King James Bible, I believe... Right, I ain't going to get into the issues of textual criticism and manuscript evidence. I believe this King James Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. Amen. And I believe that what I have in Romans through Philemon, we can sit and argue the facts all you want to, I believe what I have in Romans through Philemon was given to me through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe, that book, I believe that book's written in his blood, Bill. And, and, and I'll tell you this, man. You start messing with that book, and you're going to get on my bad side real quick. Amen. I don't care if you celebrate uh, uh, holy days or any of this other stuff. You start messing with that book, you're going to get on my bad side. Yep. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 Paul says here, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not, now notice the two nots in that verse. That'd help you out a little bit. You know, I mean, if you want to become somebody that's effective, because look, look at the end of the verse. Look at the last word in the verse. See that effect? If you want to be somebody that's effective, you're going to have to know what not to do and what to do. And Paul said that he was not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now that preaching of the gospel is the declaring of the testimony of God. We're going to see that in chapter 2, verse 1 here in a minute. But notice he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 
You see, we, we, we live in, I mean, just there's so many people in this world that have no confidence in the cross of Christ. Listen, man, I don't believe I have the wisdom to lead anybody to salvation. Hey, man, I'm not going to battle your intellect. We're not going to talk about the dinosaurs and the geologic age of the earth. I personally believe the invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Amen. Right. I believe an atheist has already been shown some things by God that he's, he's, he's just chosen to deny. Right. And I believe he's without excuse, and I don't have to debate the intellect of an atheist. I believe even the Gentiles that don't have the law have the work of the law written in their hearts. And I believe their conscience bears witness. And I believe their thoughts either accuse or else excuse one another. I believe every man has been shown by God through the creation, his eternal power and Godhead. And I believe every man in this world has, has, a, has a witness in their conscience of their sin and their guilt. Paul told the Corinthians, when I came to you, I determined not to know anything. Not Aristotle, not Socrates, not Greek philosophy, not science, not any. He said, I determined to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. Amen. 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 Now Paul comes down here and he talks about some wisdom he's got to speak to him. But what I want to talk to you this morning about is the cross of Christ and its effect upon the world. Its effect upon the world. You know, for the most part, it has a negative effect. And you as a minister of the cross and a preacher of the cross, for the most part, you're going to have a negative effect upon people. Welcome to the club. You ain't going to get along with the Masons and the, and the, and the, the great pillars of the community and the city councils and the mayors. And, and that's what Paul's going to tell the Corinthians in chapter 4. He said, now you're rich. Now, you, now you're full, you reign as kings. He said, and I would to God you did reign that we might reign with you. He said, for I think that God has set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed unto death. If, you, if you're going to be a true minister of Christ and a true preacher of the cross and give its true effect in the world, you're going to, be, you're, you're going to have a negative impact in this world for the most part. You're going to smell like death to the world. The world's not going to like you. The world's not going to like the fragrance you're letting off. But the reality is, is the cross has an effect. It has an effect on them that perish and it has an effect on them that are saved. Same message, two different effects. Right? But I want to talk to you about the cross and its effect upon the world. I believe the cross of Christ is the most undervalued and underrated event in human history, even by Christians. I believe, I believe it is the most undervalued thing that has happened in, in human history. Amen. Churches are full this morning for Easter. And they are undervaluing the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're underrating it. The wisdom and power of the cross. Look at what Paul says there in verse 24. Unto them which are called. Now back up in verse 23, the context here is Paul preaching Christ crucified. And he says in verse 24, unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Right? And I believe the wisdom and power of Christ crucified are ineffectual in men because men are too vile and unthankful to gaze in serious consideration of the fact that the one who created all things, the one who created all things and for whom all things are created, took on himself the likeness of men and died on a cross for all men. I, th I, think, I think some people are too vile and too unthankful to gaze upon that fact with serious consideration and meditation. Amen? Yes, the creator, the one who made all things, yeah. 
Paul said in Acts 17, for in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. For we, he said, as one of your own poets have said, we are all his offspring. That event deserves consideration. It, can, it, it deserves meditation from mankind, right? Men corrupt the glory of the cross. Amen. It has no effect because men corrupt its glory. Man just can't help to throw themselves into the equation of, a cre of the creator dying for them. Right there. I love what one of them old divines said one time. He said, my repentance needs repented of. My tears need washed in the blood of Christ. These people going around, repent, repent, repent. You got to repent. You got to repent. Jesus died for you. Well, I believe that, but uh, do you believe in repentance? Yeah, that's true. I believe in biblical repentance. Yeah. I don't believe in religious repentance. Religious repentance says that you got to be really, really sorry for your sins before you can be saved. I don't think you vile sinners know how to be sorry enough for your sins. You'd have to have the mind of God to understand just how vile and corrupt your sins are. Then you take these people, you, you take these same people and you say, well, have you sinned since you've been saved? Yeah, well, I guess your repentance wasn't good enough. These people corrupt the glory of God's Son dying on a cross for them. Baptisms. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. You just always got to give the glory to man, don't you? When you start preaching the cross of Christ, you're going to find out the biggest hindrance to people getting saved in America is religion. You go deal with a drug addict on the street and you'll find out they ain't got, a, they ain't got as much garbage in their head as people that's been sitting in church for 40 years. You say, you say, you going to heaven? Yeah, how do you know? Well, I was baptized. You want to try again? You want to go to church? Eh. Repentance, baptisms, confessions, mass, good works, begging at an altar, pleading till you get through. All this heathenistic prayer that think they're going to be heard for their much speaking. Come up, come down here and pray until you get the gift of tongues. That's heathenism. Amen. Prayers and your little rosary beads. Your little St. Christopher's hanging in your rear view mirror and all that stuff. Well, I just believe and I just believe and I believe God this and I believe God that. And all of it fails to realize that God in his grace freely gave us all. Freely. Yeah. Look, at, look, at, look at 1 Corinthians 12, 2, 12 and tell me I'm making anything up. That's the New Testament given to me by the blood of Christ. I don't have to guess. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Amen. Religion is the biggest hindrance to men knowing that God in his grace freely gave us all things through the death and life of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul said in Romans 8.32, he that spared not. He comes down there. Let, let's talk about that, man. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? Well, I tell you what, the free wills and the Methodists and the Catholics and the Presbyterians and everybody else don't talk intelligently about these things. By the time you get to Romans 8, 31, Paul has a question. What shall we say to these things? What should you say concerning everything you've learned up to this point? If God be for us. The, you know at one time you were at enmity with God. 
and you were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And if you're reconciled and God is now for us, who can be against us? Then he says something there. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? You know who God resists? The proud. You know who he gives grace to? The humble. God don't want your religion. He didn't want Israel's religion. He said, I'm up to my eyeballs in the fat of of fed beasts. Your new moons and your Sabbaths are an abomination. Away with it. It is iniquity. It is an abomination. My soul delighteth not. In these things. God doesn't want your religion. He freely gave you all things. Through the death and life of his son. Freely. 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 And the biggest way to make sure you don't get them. Is to keep trying to earn them. Keep thinking. That you're going to come up here. And say something special enough. To where God's going to have to hear you. Oh, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And have that heathenistic mentality that if you get enough people saying the same thing, that you're going to move God. God freely gave you all things in Christ. The effect of the cross. Look over in 1 Corinthians 2. Understanding the wisdom of God In this cross, in the midst of the wisdom of this world. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 6. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now get it. Yet, not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to not. Y'all come, I mean, most of y'all got the same sort of background that I got. I come up with fundamentalism. I tell, you, I tell you the biggest problem in fundamentalist churches is the preachers have stood up and talked more about politics than they have That's true. about the Word of God. There's more wisdom of this world flying out of pulpits than there are anything. Paul said, we don't speak the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world. Get that last phrase, that come to naught. The wisdom of this world and the princes of this world come to naught. Now, I know most Christians don't believe that. Because they're still living their lives as if the things going on in this world are eternal. And they're not. They're not. They still, they, they, still, they still watch the news. They leave their King James Bible collecting dust and still watch the news as if any of that stuff is important. And I, I, listen, you say you don't think it's important? Not at all. I don't think inflation, stock market, UN, European Union, the United States Congress, the White House, I don't think any of it's important. It's a, it won't be here 2,500 years from now. It won't even be remembered throughout all ages, world without end, amen. The former things are going to pass. The course of this world, look over in Ephesians chapter 2. I believe if Christians truly believed where they were headed... Without this cross, look at what Paul says, Ephesians 2, 1. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. The, the, The world has a course. Who's it according to? Prince of the power of the air. 
Genesis 1 through 3, that serpent interjects himself and sets the course of this world. Amen? You know what the Bible calls him? Calls him the God of this world. You know what the God of this world does? Let me, let me see if this one ties you to take it more serious. You know what the God of this world does? He blinds the minds of men. You know how he does it? Through the power of darkness. Now, if you, have, if you haven't watched, I got a video on my channel called The Power of Darkness. And if you want to understand how the power of darkness operates in this world, go watch that video. Spiritual wickedness. You live in a world of spiritual wickedness. That's right. The rulers of darkness. There is literally a power structure, guys, set up in the course of this world that is designed to blind your minds. Amen. Yep. Amen. Yes, sir. We call it media. You know, see that word? Media. You know, that, 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 these, these things deal with witchcraft. You know that, don't you? Amen. Here's a good one. Broadcasting. What are they broadly casting? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who hath bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth. You see, sometimes by the time people walk through a church door, their minds have been so blinded by the God of this world, when they step in here and listen to me, they can't understand five words coming out of my mouth. The course of this world. Do you believe what, what the Bible says about the course of this world? Right? The course of this world is according to the prince of the power of the air. The serpent interjected himself back here and set the course of this world. And we sit and talk about the Sumerians and the Babylonians and the ancient Egyptians. Oh, the ancient Egyptians were so smart. They had such great wisdom. Where are the Pharaohs? You know who I want to know? I want to know the man that ain't dead anymore. I don't care if it's Nebuchadnezzar. Whoever you want to go back there and talk about. The Greeks. Oh, the Greeks. The Greeks. Socrates. He was a pedophile. Amen? The Romans. The Romans and the, 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 the aqueducts and, all, and the roads that the Romans built and all this stuff. You know, the whole course of this world, if you believe that Bible, everything from Genesis chapter 3 onward is headed towards, you take the accumulated human history, the accumulated wisdom, the technology, the advancements, the economics, capitalism, communism, Marxism, fascism, whatever you want to take, you just gather it all together, add it up, and God says it equals a big fat zero. Amen. That's right. Not. Not. It means it comes to nothing. Look at what Paul calls it there in Ephesians 2 too. The spirit that now worketh in the children of what? You know what the course of this world is? It's disobedience. The whole course of this world is in disobedience against God. And us, us Christians should not, what is it Paul said over there in Ephesians 5? He says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Yeah, that's right, yeah. right? That's the spirit. The prince of the power of the air is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That means the people participating in the course of this world, the professors, the politicians, all of them, the, the secular school teachers. Yeah. 
You say, oh, oh you're being mean. No, I, they may not even be willing. But they are, un, they, they are unknowingly and unwillingly participating in the course of this world because there's a spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. They learned it. And you know who they learned it from? Their father. Amen. And you go out there and start preaching this message to people that's got that spirit in them. Amen. Look at what he says in verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of what? That's where the course of the world ends. Do you know that? You know why it's all going to come to nothing? Because it's all headed towards the wrath of Almighty God. Amen? The whole thing. All of human history. 6,000 years. All headed towards the wrath of God. Amen? How many of y'all believe that? Amen. The course of this world is in disobedience against God and it will end in God's wrath. And 6,000 years of accumulated wisdom, technology, philosophy, books, libraries, civilizations, religion is all going to be just go up and smoke in the day of wrath. Amen? Buddhism, there it goes. Amen. Hinduism, Islam, Catholicism. Yep. Amen. Yes, sir. Darwinian evolution. <laughs> yep. The monkey men. Out they go. Right? Now, now, some people don't believe that because they still walk as if these things are eternal. Look in 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had what? None. They that weep as though they wept not. They that rejoice as though they rejoice not. They that buy as though they what? Possess not. They that use this world is not abusing it. Why? For the fashion of this world passeth away. Amen. You know what? You know what John says? Or, or uh, I'm sorry, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. He says, the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as a woman which travail, in travail with child, and they shall not escape. The course of this world is headed towards the day of the Lord. And it will come on them as a thief in the night. When they all start screaming peace and safety, sudden destruction is going to come upon them. The Bible talks about a day, man, that Jesus Christ up here is going to shake heaven and earth for the removing of those things that are shaken. Peter said, Peter said that the day is coming in which the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. And he says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, it's of the world and the world passeth away. If you love this world, it's because you don't love the Father the way you should. Because God is going to bring an end to this world. Amen? That's the wisdom of uh, this world. It comes to nothing. But look at verse 7. Boy, that'd be a sad story, wouldn't it? The course of this world comes to naught. But look at 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God 
in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God, what? Ordained when? Before the world. That means he didn't need you. And he still don't need you. That's what, that's, that's what, that's what the creatures did. There was a wisdom ordained before Genesis 1-1 unto our glory. You know what that means? If you want glory out here, get out of this thing. The wisdom of this world's coming to nothing but wrath. But there was a wisdom ordained by God before the course of this world. That he kept hid. Paul calls it hidden wisdom. And he ordained it unto our glory. For how long? Throughout all ages. It won't come to nothing. And he ordained it before the world unto our glory. You know what that means? Has nothing to do with you. Amen? Amen? You know what Paul said? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow them he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son and whom he predestinated them he also called Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. Bam. Ain't none of this getting in and getting out. Foreknowledge, predestination. That just took you from before the world began to eternity. One verse. Whom he foreknew, he predestinated. That's foreknowledge, past, predestinated future. Yes, sir. And then in time, he called you, justified you, and then he's going to glorify you. Amen. That's it. You say, but what about my part? You just can't let it go, can you? <laughs> Got to do something, don't you? Yeah, well, yeah. Why, you'd mess that thing up so bad? This is why God ordained it before the world. What shall we then say to these things, Paul says? If God be for us, right there. You realize how how he's been working all things together for your glory? People read that verse. We know that all things work together for good. And they talk about losing their job. And they talk about this. And they talk about that. You realize what the the, the actual massiveness of that verse goes beyond the details of your life. All things have been worked together by God for your good. Amen? And he ordained it before the world. And guess what? The actual, when it comes to the details of your life, here, Paul said, none of them can separate you from this. Death, life, things present, things to come, height, death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 1 says that God predestinated us to the adoption of children before the foundation of the world. We're not talking about John Calvin. Leave that that clown Leave that clown in the grave, man. We would just leave him there. We're not talking about Calvinism. Predestination means a predestinated uh, uh, destiny. God predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. He's predestinated us to an inheritance according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in himself. 
And in time when we trusted and believed the gospel of our salvation, when we trusted in Christ upon hearing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, God took me and sealed me in Christ unto that day of redemption. I'm not coming to not. And I'm so far ahead of what's going on in this world, man. Don't bore me with what's going on in it. <laughs> oh, Ravi Zechariah. Oh, what a waste of time. I've heard that guy de debate college professors on the existence of God, and not one time has he ever talked about the cross of my Savior. I'm not saying he never did. That man battled, the, he, he argued on the, on the basis of worldly wisdom, man. I ain't got time for the wisdom of this world. It comes to nothing. Now you see here, God has now made this wisdom known. We ain't going to get even close to getting done. God has now made this hidden wisdom. While the, while the course of this world was running rampant and the course of this world was out of control, God had this hidden wisdom up here that had the princes of this world known what God had ordained and kept hidden himself, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That tells me that the cross was the most important event in human history. It was that cross that took the wise in their own craftiness. It was that cross that brought to nothing the wisdom of this world. And it was that cross that brought to me what God had ordained for me. Look, 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 look at what he says in verse 9. Look at some of these things. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Notice that. There's been some things prepared for those that love God. Yes, things prepared, but they're hid. Amen. Amen. Natural man can't get them. We're going to see that in a second. But there's been some things prepared for those that love God. These things have been revealed in verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all what? Things. Yea, the deep things of God. You've got to understand a verse like that. Right? You've got to understand a verse like that. You know where the deep things of God are? Right there. Do you know, do you know when, you're, when you're reading this book and you're digging into this book and you're studying this book? That you, the Spirit of God, is searching the deep things of God. And He's teaching you by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That comparing spiritual things with spiritual goes back to this searching of the deep things of God. The Spirit of God reveals these things to you. Not, not by you coming to an altar and asking for it. It's taught to you. It's taught to you and revealed to you. Now look at what Paul says in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. That's that, this wisdom here. Right? Just, uh, just keep your eyes about a year ahead, you know. That's what the world does. The world don't want you looking too far in the future. Right? You ever, notice, you ever notice how Hollywood and media always, always tries to portray these, these happy endings? You ever notice that? There is no happy ending to this world. I tell people all the time, a man that dies without Christ is the most pathetic, pitiful thing that, ever, that you could ever tell a story about. Born without asking. Born knowing nothing. Everything he learns is a bunch of garbage. That's right. Everybody he loves, he loses. Most of what he learns, he forgets. Everything he earns, he loses. He came in naked, he leaves naked. Yeah. And if he dies without Christ, he has no hope. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Amen? That's a sad story. But Paul said, we haven't received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Notice, things prepared, things revealed, and we now know the things that are freely given. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak. I'm going to tell you something, man. A religion not speaking to you the things that have been freely given to you by God is not a religion that has anything to do with the Holy Spirit of God today. The Spirit of God is not involved in teaching you what you have to do to earn something from God. The Spirit of God is revealing to you the things that God in His preordained wisdom prepared for you and kept hid. And now revealed them so that you can know the things that have been freely given to you. And these are the things that we also speak. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. A natural man's always got to do something. These things are spiritually discerned. Amen? Amen. Not emotionally discerned. Oh, I, we just felt, you know, I went to that church and it just felt, whew, it just felt so spiritual, you know? That's a natural man. Man, get up, man, get up, just lie to you for 45 minutes, but it made you feel good. Now see, now see what I'm talking about, these things... Of the hidden wisdom of God are not discerned by your natural man. They're discerned spiritually. Right? And so the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God interrupted, interrupted the road to nowhere. You understand that? Yes, and it's right there. Yes, that cross interrupted your road to nowhere. And set you on the preordained eternal purpose of God. Amen. These things are so different, it's not even funny. Nothing won't be remembered. Eternal glory. Amen. What are you going to do? What will you do? How can you earn what God ordained, prepared, and freely gave? God in his wisdom took the wise in their own craftiness and freely gave those that love him all things through death and the life of Christ. And now God forbid that I should glory. Amen. God forbid that I should glory save in what? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God forbid you to glory in anything except the cross of his son. It's forbidden. Where is boasting, Paul said? It is excluded. By what law, he asked? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Amen? Guess what? That tells me that not one work plays a role in this thing. That's right. Not one. Because if Christ did 99.9% .9 and I had to do the other 0.1%, uh, I would have, I would have a, 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 a place to glory and boast. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Paul said, God forbid I should glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me this world's dead to me and I'm dead to it I want nothing to do with it zilch zero nada nothing look at 1 Corinthians 1 17 I gotta, I gotta get some of this out real quick Notice what Paul was not sent to do and what he was sent to do. He was sent to preach the gospel. 
That gospel is the, if you look over in 2.1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you what? The testimony of God. Look what it is in verse 2. Christ and him crucified. That's the, te- that's the testimony of God. Do you, I mean, you ever, you ever think about phrases like that? Man goes into a courtroom and gives his testimony. Testifies. Christ and him crucified is the testimony of God. It's what God has testified concerning his son. The very, what Paul's declaring to you, man, has nothing to do with the, with the accumulated learning of men. Has nothing to do with systematic theology or anything like that. Amen? Paul, Paul, Paul says that, that when he came, he said, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I didn't come with wisdom. He said, I was simply declaring unto you the testimony of God, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Christ and him crucified. Amen? There's not a more sacred nor more confirmed truth than God's testimony. You understand that? But you know what I've noticed about men? I'm 41 years old, man. I'm I'm getting up there where I can start talking intelligently about what I've seen in mankind over 41 years of my life. I've observed them. Men are some of the most vile and ruthless creatures that there are. Amen. Amen. You take CNN, and then people parade sex perverts in front of your television. Men like Anderson Cooper and Don, Don Lemon and people like that. And Fox News ain't no better. You people ought to be ashamed of yourself thinking Fox News is something good when they got Caitlyn Jenner coming on there. That's right. Yeah. That's a sex pervert. Yeah. That's, a, that's a perversion of the very laws of nature. We ain't even talking about spiritual laws. And I'm not sitting here trying to con- condemn anybody, but they parade men dressed up as women on there. Sexual deviants and perverts. And in 20 years of bewitching people through what I've already talked about, broadcasting. In 20 years they've never mentioned to you the testimony of God. The man who did Paul, the world took him, beat him, chopped his head off. And you think the course of this world has changed in 2,000 years? Need I mind you that just 80 years ago, there was a nation that took 6 million Jews and burned them in ovens? Your world ain't changed. And you Christians have been asleep at the wheel for so long, sitting and watching that garbage for so long, That it's coming to your country. Amen. What kept him out of our country for so long was the light. And when the light goes out, the darkness comes rushing in. Oh, Nazi Germany could never happen here. Have you looked at the people in your country lately? I mean, I mean, listen, these liars and sex perverts can lie to you time and time again, and yet you'll believe their testimony. 80 million people are going to die from a virus. <laughs> Let's barricade ourselves underground. Let's let them shut the world down. Let's let them treat our children like they're in concentration camps. Let's let them stick masks over their face and smother them all day long. While these these hypocrites take pictures of them and the teachers don't even have masks on and got little four or five year old kids sitting there smothering to death. Because you believe them. And then God tells you something. I don't know. 
God tells you he freely gave you all things in Christ. Well, I don't know. I know what John said about it. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The water and the blood and the spirit and these three agree in one. And he, he, said, he said, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. That's right. If you'll believe a man, the witness of God is greater. Sure. Amen. Are you ready for it? He that believeth hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not hath made God a liar. For he hath not believed the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record. That God hath, hath given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Amen. 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 Now see if CNN or Fox are going to tell you that one. Last, last, last thing. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again. Now what I want you to understand is that this testimony here, it don't need my wisdom. No. Paul said he didn't preach it with wisdom of words, meaning that word wisdom there is where we get the word sophistication. Sophia in Greek. Word, the wisdom of words. Words is the, where we get the, it's the Greek word logos. We get words like logic out of it. What Paul's saying is he's saying, when I preach this gospel to you, I didn't preach it to you out of some sophisticated system of logic and thought. I didn't, I didn't come up, listen man, God doesn't need me. You know, when, when, when we went street preaching there two weeks ago, I wrote out all these notes on cards and stuff, stuck them in my Bible, but then I never pulled them out. God doesn't need me to sit and come up. He gave me the testimony. Jesus Christ died on a cross for sinners. Mm -hmm. And God didn't call me to go out and stand on a street corner, sit there and plead with the wisdom of men. Yeah. Argue with them about atheism and Darwinian evolution. I ain't got time for that. That's right. Jesus Christ died for you. If you don't like it, move down the road. I mean, honest to goodness, man, Paul said the preaching of the cross, look in verse 18, when we, when we start muddying up our wisdom into this thing, we make that cross without effect. And what is the effect of the cross? Look at verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. But what are you going to do about it? You see, if, I, if my goal is to get people in, you know what I'm going to start doing? I'm going to start trying to entice them. And before you know it, you ain't got no power left. If I start trying to entice every, every infidel out there that thinks that message is foolishness, if I start trying to entice them with everything under the sun, before you know it, I'm going to lose the message that has the power to save them that actually believe. I just know this, if I preach Christ and Him crucified to a hundred people and a hundred people thinks it's foolishness, guess what? I had the effect. It's still the cross. Now here's, here, now listen, I'm closing, look over in chapter four. I'll read you this, I want to read you this. See, what I want you to understand, man, is that you can all be effectual. People say, well, I'm a dummy. Well, I don't know anything, or I don't know this. We preach Christ and Him crucified. God, God has destroyed the wisdom of this world. He ain't operating in the wisdom of man anyway. Amen? Amen? After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, what? Knew not God. It pleased God, what? By the foolishness of preaching. Notice that the world by wisdom and God by foolishness. 
The world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. This world right here don't know God. It's heading for a bonfire. But it pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching of that cross to save them that believe and call them into that eternal purpose. Then let the world do what the world's going to do. Amen. But I want you to know this. Paul said, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ and them that perish and in them that are saved. You know, you know, you smell like Christ in those that perish and in those that are saved. If you're doing what you're supposed to do. To the one we are the savor of death unto death. And to the other the savor of life unto life. The same man preaching the same thing gives off two smells to do two different people. The one you give off the stench of death to the other one you give off the fragrance of life. And who is sufficient for these things? Our sufficiency is of God. Amen. Look at what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 4 and I'm done. Because God has called you. But he didn't call you, he didn't call you because you're wise. He didn't call you because you're mighty. He didn't call you because of your nobility. God chose the foolish things to confound the wise. He chose the weak things to confound the mighty. He chose base things and things despised, yea, and things that are not, to bring to naught the things that are. As it is written, let him that glory, glory in the Lord, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now look at, look at what Paul says to these Corinthians here in 4.8. Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign that we might also reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death. Paul, Paul, what Paul's talking about here, man, is he's talking about them Roman Colosseums. He's talking about the old Colosseums, man, where they would have those gladiator games. And they would have games throughout the day. And then the ones brought in last, the ones brought in last were appointed to death. And Paul says, I think God has appointed us. He's made us last. He set us last and appointed us to death. Yea, we are a spectacle. They would bring, in, they would bring them in into this Colosseum to be a spectacle. And Paul said, and guess what? If that gladiator survived that day, it was only to be thrown back in there to next. Paul had the sentence in his, he, he died, man. He died daily. He had the sentence of death in himself every day. He was always bearing in his body the death of Christ so that the world could see the life of Christ in him. The excellency of God's power of that cross and that wisdom, that power is only manifested to the world through your weakness and your suffering. Paul said, we are fools, but ye are wise. Being sarcastic if you don't know. He's saying, us apostles are fools, but you Corinthians are wise. Us apostles are Weak, but you Corinthians are strong. Us apostles are honor, or, or, or ye are honorable. You Corinthians are honorable, but we are despised. Under this present hour, we both, read, read that context there. Paul's being sarcastic with them, but then he writes and says, I don't write these things to shame you. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. You see, if you're operating, if you're operating under this wisdom here, if you're operating under this hidden wisdom of God, that wisdom functioning in you is going to make you a spectacle to this world. Three groups of people. We are a spectacle unto men, unto angels, and unto the world. Those are the three wisdoms operating in this world. The wisdom of men, the wisdom of the world, and the wisdom of the princes of this world. And this wisdom of God operating in us is making us a spectacle unto this world. We are always delivered unto death that we might manifest the power and life of Christ in us. Amen? So, hope you understand that stuff. I hope you get that stuff. The effect of the cross. 
Don't worry about the people who don't listen to you. That's one of the effects of the cross is it's foolishness to them that perish. Amen? So don't, 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 don't start trying to entice the world with your message because then you're going to make the cross without effect. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of life. God, I thank you for the precious blood that was shed for us on the cross. I thank you for each and every one that came out here this morning, Lord. I, I know those that are here, Father, are here for the right reasons. They're, they're here because they love your word. They're not here for the bells and the whistles and the, and, the, and the flashy things that we offer the flesh. They're here, Father, because they love that book. And they want to learn that book and to grow up into that book, Father, and to, to be able to walk and function in the, in the godliness that you've ordained for us and the wisdom that you've ordained for us. And Father, I just pray that the power of your Son may live in each and every one of us, Father, to bring us closer together as a, as a body functioning under the headship of Christ, Lord, but also to, to go out into this world and to manifest the excellency of the power of your word working in us, Father, uh, 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 before this world to be seen of angels and to be seen of men as the power of your word works effectually in us that believe. Father, may we have the heart to to cry, Abba, Father, and to, and to bear in our bodies the death of your Son, that his life might be manifest working in our mortal flesh. And God, I just ask now that you be with us in the remainder of the service, Lord, and, and we just pray that your word would be magnified and your Son glorified here this morning. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.